We're off. Cool. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to what's my staccato? Yeah. Like, what's <laughs> 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 don't panic it's the silly skinny <laughs> podcast uh, it is once again the podcast from the team behind the skinny magazine we're back at ehfm thanks to fina for setting everything up i feel confident i feel ready to go i feel rested and rejuvenated after a weekend in a field <laughs> uh, that may explain some of the content that is on the way shortly but there you go. <laughs> so we've got anaheat hi jamie hello lewis hello and we are going to be talking about some films that have come out in the course of the last year. Now, you're not to know this, dear listener, but we've been quite busy recently and there's been <laughs> a limited amount of things to watch and time to watch them in. So we're going to do first part as usual. We're going to talk about some big films that have come out and are varying degrees of good. Uh, and then after that, we're going to do a little recap of the year so far, the things we have liked, the things we have not liked, other things also. <laughs> It will be fun. Lewis, do you feel confident in that? Sure, yeah. Cool, solid. <laughs> Lewis always has my back. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, so we'll crack on with that shortly. Uh, but for now, we're going to dive straight into talking about Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones, the famous American archaeologist slash adventurer slash hat aficionado. He's back. He's got a new film. He's got a new film. He's a fictional character. Harrison Ford is back. He's Indiana Jones in the di Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. It says on the notes we simply cannot go on like this. That's not a <laughs> reference to this introduction. But Anna, he is it a reference to the film that you watched? It is a reference to the film. I really didn't like it at all, and I love Indiana Jones. I really, really do. The third, like the Last Crusade, is one of my favorite films ever. I think it's so good. Um, but yeah, I thought it was so. Yeah, what it's about. If it's about, like, it's really not about anything. Like, I'll be honest with you. It's about, like, he's old and his son has died off screen because his son's played by Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> so there's only so much you can do with that. And he's feeling very sad. And it's, like, the late 60s when, like, the moon landings are happening. And he, there's, like, a flashback to his younger years, which is, like, loads of CGI de-aging. And then we realize that he is looking for this like fucking dial of destiny and his goddaughter played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge comes along and they go to various Middle Eastern coded countries and look for this fucking dial. Like that's the whole plot. I couldn't tell you like specifics about anything because I was so bored the <sighs> whole time. <laughs> can, you, can you give me a little bit of specifics on the dial itself? Is so, it a watch? Is it a clock? What no, is it? I don't know. I think it's kind of like a sundial but there's no sun involved there's kind of like a timey thing it's meant to be able to send you back in time um they've all been based on actual myths though right so far so they, yeah so they're really religious most of them um apart from temple of doom which i haven't seen that much because it's very racist against my people <laughs> yeah, um but i think that one is less religious but then raiders and last crusade are like very mm. very like christian um, i believe this, that uh rory Doherty, yeah, right. Off the thing. of this, off of this parish, occasionally wrote a very good thing about, about the kind like, of, yeah, the fact yeah. that it's not religious and that's well. This is meant to be a contraption that's made by Archimedes. Yeah, so I was gonna say it's the Dial of Archimedes, which at a certain point when they kept saying the Dial of Archimedes, it was like someone had just spun a wheel and been like the yeah. Dial of Archimedes. Like it could be fucking Euripides's like soup spoon. Like it makes <laughs> no difference at this point. Like you were just saying that's the next issue. <laughs> that is the next one. Swings wild, <laughs> swings wildly for MacGuffin, lands on dial of Archimedes. Like, for God's takes the rest sake. of the day off. <laughs> yeah, it's just it was so silly. Like it has no like cultural resonance in the way that like the kind of Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail have cultural resonance. So it kind of says something and you're buying into something to kind of create this narrative out of it. This, I don't give a shit. I just spend the whole time being like, was Archimedes the one with the water? And then at a certain point towards the end, I was like, he is the one with the yeah, water. Eureka. A, yeah, yeah, Eureka, the water displacement. That does figure in the plot. But other than that, it didn't have to be Archimedes. Um, it's ostensibly a film about grief, but I think it didn't really dig down deep enough to kind of make it about that. I think probably because the grief comes from a film that no one cared about. Like, no one liked Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. No one remembers that Harrison Ford's, like, Indiana Jones has a son. So the fact that his son has died off screen, like, means very little to all of us, like, as a people. Um, I didn't ever think there was, like, one big set piece that was really good, which I think is what defines Indiana Jones a lot, is, like, you have the rolling boulder and you have the kind of him stepping off 
the chasm and then like the bridge like it's kind of set pieces like the tank chase like this stuff is like really iconic and there was nothing about this that was iconic um the de-aging was weird um he looked very dead-eyed god bless um and I also thought, I know this was directed by James Mangold, but I think it was produced by Steven Spielberg. And Steven Spielberg once very famously said that after making Schindler's List, he would never make a film just kind of making fun of Nazis again. Because he was like, I've learned that it's actually a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> well done, Steve. <laughs> and then I said to myself... Carrie Bradshaw over here. I think yeah, what like, you're saying more is like, it, there's no comedy Nazis. Because the thing about The Last Crusade, it's really a comedy. It's the funniest one. And, it is, and, and it's yeah. done for laughs. I, I guess that was his point, maybe. But then this one was also very silly. Like, do you know what I mean? I don't want to spoil anything, but definitely towards the end, it's just silly. Like, it's not comedy, but it is ridiculous. Like, it's not really like kind of the weight of fascism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? I know, yeah. You know, the famously <laughs> bant filled topic of yeah. the weight of fascism. But there's a one really actually excellent scene I think about fascism is when um, uh, uh, a waiter comes into a hotel room yeah, and it's actually it. very sinister it's, it's Maz mm. Mikkelsen is playing this Nazi who's now sort of um, reinvented himself as a scientist he's, he's supposedly involved um, with creating the rocket that went to the moon uh, and there's a really I thought really sinister and one of the better scenes in the whole movie is where he uh, basically you know uh, threatens this black um waiter who's just bringing him his like dinner um yeah they're really really sinister i thought it was actually quite effective yeah and the bit where he keeps being like no but where are you from and the guy is like i was born in the bronx yeah full stop <laughs> i like that guy yeah that guy was great but that might have been he might be the best bit about the film i just didn't like it i don't know i think indiana jones works not because it's just like a collection of like hats <laughs> 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 you know like it works because it has narrative and it has charm and it has you know something and this just doesn't have something like this doesn't need to exist and i think the mark of a film needs to be that it in some way deserves to exist so yes. it's a no from over there <laughs> yeah sorry uh jamie says here that archimedes died during the siege of syracuse when he was killed by a roman soldier despite orders that he should not be harmed <laughs> Spoiler. I, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. How much of this... Right. Okay, now I'm really confused. How much of this film takes place during the Siege of Syracuse? Oh, my friend. <laughs> oh, fuck. It's got time travel in it. Oh, yeah. yes. I oh. love as well that, like, yeah, you're right. The first few Indiana Jones films, the God is the power, really, right? Like, the Holy Grail is real. The Ark of the Covenant is real. So it is this sort of narrative world wherein... God is magical and has all these artifacts left behind. But in this one, apparently, the 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 mathematician Archimedes was just a wizard. Well, it begins actually. He's, they are chasing in the very opening scene. They are chasing what is it called? The spear of uh, you. Uh, uh, oh, uh, the lance of uh, lance of longitus. Lon longitus. Yes. So they're, they're chasing that. That is that turns out to be what the initial. Uh, MacGuffin is, but then and he says that oh, this is a lot of rubbish. That you know, I don't believe in this. And then, <laughs> ja Jamie, before we go, before we go any further, is this a film that's going to try and teach me about maths? Uh, no, I am concerned that this is all people are talking about things like long. I love the idea that the, Indiana Jones the area of a long, long, long Janus. long Janus. I love that Indiana Jones is <laughs> not long. Not how, long how dare you? <laughs> I love that Indiana Jones has watched the Ark of the Covenant <laughs> melt him and Nazi's face off and is still like, oh, I don't believe in God. And it's like, dude. Yeah, when he was like, I don't believe in magic. It's like, babe, what are you talking about? <laughs> you literally met a guy who was a yeah. thousand years old. <laughs> King Arthur or whatever. I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I just really miss the absence of Steven Spielberg here. You know, James Mangold, God bless him. He's a solid enough director, safe player hands, but he cannot create a nice image or a, exciting scent piece it just doesn't happen in the, in the whole entire movie you're totally right it's it's really missing what makes like our uh raiders of the lost ark and uh, temple doom really exciting it's just it's scene after scene of iconic imagery and it, there's nothing here it's just a cgi mess and i think it's the over reliance of cgi and cinema gen in general that uh, means holding it back i mean for example there's a big uh set piece where indy's on a horse right um, uh, running through New York. Filmed in Glasgow. Filmed in Glasgow. I saw that horse. I know. <laughs> <laughs> was it real? It, it looked fake to me. No, <laughs> what was it? Was it top of like two men? Like, <laughs> okay, <what? laughs> Also, the way that you said filmed in Glasgow, I saw that horse like it'd been in like the hugging pine. 
like, I saw that horse cut in front of me at the yeah. bar. Smoking a fag, yeah, tough day yeah. on set. Yeah. Oh, Harrison Ford, what an arse. I don't care how big of a star you are. You wait in a queue like everybody else. Yeah, it was so distracting because that scene is clearly set over like a hundred meters of city center pavement. Uh, but it, like that horse is running for five minutes. I'm sorry, that is not that is not how long that street is. No. It was very distracting. They were going past the same point again and again. But anyway, I think hopefully if you're not from Glasgow that you won't be distracted by that. I was, because it's just muddy and looks unfinished. It doesn't look well rendered. But the good thing is it's short because there's another scene on a tuk-tuk in Tangier which goes on forever. Forever! It just would not stop. It's like, and it, never at one moment did I think they were really in a tuk-tuk rushing through Tangier. It just did not look real. And, and the way that, if you go, it was, I think it was slightly um, a homage to Temple of Doom, you know, when they're running around in the, the mines. Which is like half the film. Yeah, but yeah. How, how is that, how does that film from like 19... 19- 85 or 86 look better than a film made today i do not understand why this looks so bad um so, so that was my problem i think the best thing about it is harrison ford harrison ford is great um he has always been a bit world weirdy that's the thing that's why people like indies this kind of curmudgeon who was always a bit annoyed about being on these adventures anyway he was always just knackered and sick of like trying to avoid nazis and death you know like he's always like one <laughs> he's just like going by the skin of his pants he's not like a heroic hero in that way he's always like just knackered and like beat up yes. and like getting it's like hammered. a Top Gear special. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He's basically he's a, he's James James from Top Gear. Yeah, I was gonna say with I was gonna say like a Top Gear special with less fash, but then yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of fash. Yeah. But you know, um, but he's just he's just got so much charisma. He's a, a like even. At AA, he's like so much charisma, so much style. He's a great, he's a great, great, great person to watch on screen. Full of wisecracks. Um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is okay. She's basically just doing flea bag routine. Um, you know, mm. like we've seen it before. It was like fun enough, I guess. But she was kind of mischievous and up for it. So, so the, the acting work and 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 the performances are really good. It just the whole film around about it is a mess. Um, sloppy filmmaking. Uh, yeah, and it just missed spielberg's kind of eye for detail and sort of uh you know and, and i think part of what ruined it is i watched it the same day as another film we're going to talk about which is just full of like really good film craft and that's what's missing i think it's just like yeah and um, that's the disappointing part for me i i actually liked the, the daft ending i i think you know i, I don't mind a bit of daftness uh and you know archimedes I, I, you know why not have a secular uh, why, why do you want the original literature stuff? Have, have a little so, secular artifact. That's interesting to me. But if the secular artifact were real, like, do you know, if we knew about it, I think it may be, a, a, it's probably something he was working on. But, like, had you ever heard of the Diet of Archimedes before this film? No. Well, then there we go. So, who would win in a fight between um, the Indiana Jones, actually empirically real god with all of his magic toys, or. Indiana Jones's wizard Archimedes, who was a mathematician, but also apparently could travel through time. Well, I mean, the toys aren't exactly that useful, are they? You used to open a box and it melts people's face off. It's not like it's indiscriminate, you know? Like, it's, it's, or no, you, because they didn't look at it. Oh, you, yeah, you don't look at it. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's easy to avoid. Did you just call the Ark of the Covenant a toy? <laughs> <laughs> and then and then said, it's not that useful. Okay, it melts anyone who looks at it. But other than that, I mean, what? <laughs> well, what are the real world implications of that? Come on, Pierre. You just point it at whoever you want to melt. <laughs> <laughs> Until they're melted. At, le- at least the dial would look nice on the mantelpiece. It looks, you know, it looks like a little clock or something. I mean, Magic. if you kept the arc closed, it would look nice on a mantelpiece. A big mantelpiece. <laughs> yeah. yeah, people coming around to your house being like, oh, that's nice. No! Yeah. <laughs> Not again! A melted Deirdre. <laughs> if this keeps happening, we're going to have to move. <laughs> the cup is the most useful one, I think. Like, uh, the cup no, of Christ. No, but the point is that you shouldn't want to use it. Yeah, and also you have to stay in that cave, yeah, which, which exactly. looks rubbish. Yeah, so, so what's... Yeah. Yeah. And then what is, the, what is the second one about? Stones? Magic stones? I can't remember. Well, you guys, he pulls his heart out. That's what I remember. Yeah, yeah that's all I remember. Like the fir- Again, it's sort of split into two halves. The first half is just rampant racism and misogyny. And then the second half is a, a quite fun uh, wagon ride through some caves. Yeah. Yeah. It is the sexiest Harrison Ford has ever looked, though, is Temple of Doom. I will say that. It has that going for him. And by the way, it's not good. It's pretty succinct. <laughs> <laughs> good, good place to stop us in. <laughs> right, next up this week, Mission Impossible colon Dead Reckoning Part 1, a film that only Jamie has seen, but as he just said in the break, <laughs> ah, just chip in if you want. 
see how you feel. So this film is presumably, I mean, what do, what do people want this film to be about? Seeing as we're just going on like the, we're now on the open market. The open market <laughs> of place of opinions. ideas. Yeah. Just come on, whatever you want. I don't know. Uh, right, okay. So Jamie, you've seen Mission Impossible colon Dead Reckoning brackets part one. Did you enjoy it? Was it good? Is it? I presume that it's better than Indiana Jones, given that was the way that that previous setup payoff went. Yeah, it's interesting watching because I watched this on the same day as uh, Dial Destiny, and what's interesting is it's you know they're very similar. You're aging action stars. I think what what Mission Impossible has over it is like like I say, it's 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 Tom Cruise has is invested in practical effects that's what he's into and i think chris mcquarrie has been a really great addition to that series like i think the last three or four um mission puzzle films which he's sort of had a hand either writing or directing have been excellent so i think they're quite a good team together um you know after maverick last year uh this this year he's shown that he loves practical work you know like like that's what i think why top gun to me felt like a revelation i mean it wasn't any different to any film you would see in the 90s or 80s what made it feel feel fantastic was it was real people doing real things you know so people in planes and here i feel that when tom cruise is rushing around um rome in a fiat 2000 i feel like he's in a fiat 2000 when he's jumping off a mountain i feel he is jumping off a mountain and i never felt that kind of thrill watching uh, indiana jones i should maybe say what a little bit the plot about oh you know even though the plot to Mission Impossible films don't really doesn't really matter. Again, it's about a MacGuffin. Um, it's finding something and running somewhere um, from pl- uh, place to place. But here, uh, the main threat is an AI, um, a kind of computer program which has infiltrated every single computer system on the planet and has the power to basically destroy the world and destroy like like finance. But because obviously it's such a powerful weapon, everybody wants a hold of it. So um, the, the American government are after it. Uh, Vanessa Kirby, who is the White Widow, she's in here trying to get hold of um, the the technology so she can sell it to the highest bidder. Um, and then Ethan Hunt, who was working for the American government, has went rogue once again, as he tends to do. He loves to do, he loves to go rogue. Um, he wants to get it and destroy it because he knows if MD has this power, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a good thing. But that's by the by. I think it's, it's, it's really just an excuse to see Tom Cruise do a lot of running, like do action set pieces, and I think that's what I like about that, the Mission Impossible series. I think, un, unlike the Dial of Destiny, there are scenes here which are very memorable. You know, there's a, a great chase on top of a train, um, uh, the Orient Express. It felt like Tom Cruise was on the train. Um, and there's a similar scene in Dial of Destiny, which does not feel like that. It feels no. like computer generated. It's like muddy. So yeah, that's the advantage of this film. It's like, um, it's, it's proper good old fashioned filmmaking. I've... Sorry, that's a very, very long pause there. Um, I've not seen many of the recent Mission Impossibles. I remember it was a couple of months ago we talked about Mission Impossible very briefly on this very podcast, and I talked about the first one. The first one's very good, but it's very kind of like spy craft, pay attention to this chewing gum because when you press it together, it blows up this fish tank. But, like, yeah, I've not seen many. How does this compare with the other ones of this era of Mission Impossible? Well, part of the appeal of it is you've got Tom Cruise, and he's got this kind of crazy energy. Um, and he is actually quite an interesting leading man um, and that he's just quite intense. You know, he's not like, he doesn't have the charisma of Harrison Ford. He's like, just like a action figure that came to life, you know, and that's, that's, that's the appeal of him. And then around him, you have people like Vic Reams, you've got Simon Pegg, you've got Rebecca Ferguson, who are much more endearing. They bring a bit of humanity to it, you know, a bit of humanity to Tom Cruise's intense energy. But uh, I I like the kind of spy craft. I think this film leans into that more. You know, it's got the whole, uh, you know, putting on rubber heads and disguises people. You know, that's a, a big part of the film. It's like, it's, you know, it's like it's like James Bond, but a bit more silly, I think, is, what, is why I kind of enjoy it. It's like, a, you know, Tom Cruise doing daft things. The stakes are usually, oh, we have to get hold of this thing. Um or the world will end, you know, but it's like, it's the same thing over and over again, but it's, it's very enjoyable. The formula is, is enjoyable to watch. Um, and like I say, Chris McQuarrie knows how to direct a, a movie, you know, I knew, you know, when, when, when we're watching a, um, a chase through the city, we know exactly where each character is. It's very clear. It's linear. It's lucid. Um, and I think that's what sets it apart from, uh, yeah, like, uh, other action films of this, uh, ilk. 
Do you want to tell everybody, speaking of this being a film about a rogue AI, do you want to tell everybody about what happened when you tried to watch the film? Oh, God. This is, a different, <laughs> this is different from the last story that Jimmy told about the time we tried to watch the film. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a press screen in Glasgow, um, and the film starts, it, it seems fine, but then it starts to glitch, um, and it glitches during this kind of flashback section, and it wasn't clear if the glitch was to do with this AI. I thought, oh, this is quite avant-garde filmmaking from Christopher Columbia. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, it's like Tom Cruise is going all wonky. He's, he's like, uh, what happens the colour uh, would separate. So you'd have like this kind of halo effect every time Tom Cruise moved of like <laughs> greens and reds around his head. Looked kind of cool, but it was, you know, but it's very, uh, it was like turned out the actual, uh, or quite appositely the file had been corrupted that they were playing it on and they couldn't fix it. So we just had to watch it with this kind of weird halo effect over it. But I think that's a test of the film, even despite the fact that the, the file was screwed up and Tom Cruise had a weird green aura through all the action scenes. It's still very enjoyable to watch. So um, I think that sort of says it works, you know, like it, like uh, even though the file was ruined, uh, <laughs> it, it was very, it was watchable. Have I, have I ever told on this podcast my story about a corrupted file is this the matrix when it stopped showing no this is the one that when i worked in a cinema and we had toy story 3 on <laughs> and it was an absolutely packed this is when orange wednesday was still a thing if any real heads know <laughs> um, and it was absolutely packed screen on like a wednesday night and it got to the point where andy hands over woody to the girl and the film just froze <laughs> But it froze and the soundtrack kind of caught, you know, when like a record catches in the groove. So the film froze at the point of the handover and the soundtrack started going. <laughs> and because the film was nearly finished, I was waiting to come in and like tidy up. And uh, so I was standing in full view of most of the audience. And when that happened, I just burst out laughing incredibly <laughs> loudly. And people, for the best part, saw the funny side. Some of them did not see the funny <laughs> side. But in that kind of situation, when the AI is against you, what can you do? What can you do? I mean, clearly nothing. No, and laugh. I was, yeah. <laughs> oh, laugh along, lads. Oh, oh, stop throwing things at me. Why have you all got so much popcorn left? I mean, I would say it, the AI is not the greatest baddie. It would remind me a little bit of that really bad Avengers film, uh, like Age of Ultron, uh, where like mm -hmm. an AI takes over. That's the kind of vibe. So it's not the greatest of bad guy. He has like a this emissary, this kind of henchman called Gabriel, who's not very interesting. So yeah, I mean, if, if anything, this film is missing like a Sean Harris or like a really, or like a, a Philip Sewell Hoffman, you know, that's what I remember. Um, th those are some of the kind of better actors who have been the bad uh, op guy opposite Ethan Hunt um, in previous films. And this one didn't really have that kind of juice, you know. But still better than Indiana Jones. I mean, yeah. Good stuff. That's as solid a recommendation as you're going to get, I think. <laughs> Okay, so that's the new releases out of the way. And because we have reached the exact midpoint of the year, and for various other reasons that were discussed earlier, <laughs> we thought we'd have a little chat about our favourite films of 2023 so far. So we're talking best new films we've seen, best films for discourse, i.e. films that we didn't like but simply must discuss, because that's who we are. Um, our favourite ways in which we've watched films, favourite old films, oh, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you know what it is? It's a bunch of people talking about films that they have liked. It doesn't require this level of explanation. <laughs> but I've started now and I'm going to continue until I can find an easy segue off to ask someone what their favourite film of this year so far is. Lewis, I've found it. <laughs> you um, just need to keep the bike moving and eventually you'll find a turn off. Lewis, your favourite <laughs> film of 2023 so far, if you would. Uh, well, this is one that we've talked about on the podcast at length, but Blue Jean really, really stuck with me. Um, I don't know if it's just because I was more excited than average for this film, and it did pay off. Like, it didn't let me down at all. Here's the thing, right? Conservatives push this rhetoric that the LGBT community is, like, quote-unquote recruiting people, which is just bigoted paranoia. But were there to be, like, a recruitment ad for young LGBT <laughs> people? I think this this would be a fantastic film for, like, a young queer audience who are maybe, like, less familiar with the history of the community and the ways that, like, queer identity have been shaped by legislation. It's, it's got this, you know, pretty iconic history lesson on Section 28, which I can't really think of many dramatizations of, but it that's actually... Uh, a, a really significant thing like it 
it, it created this necessity for discretion, but it sort of like, well, that, that, that shows up in queer cinema a lot, but what doesn't is how the kind of, you know, the, the homophobic rhetoric of the government has pushed some people deeper into the closet and some people even further out. Like, Jean doesn't want to live like an exile, like all of her friends live, but uh, she suffers from this, like, terrible bodily oppression. So, and then, you know, you get to see this rift, this rift that's, that's rendered between members of the queer community, but cleverly, like, it never points the fingers at the, uh, the characters who are fighting amongst themselves. We all know that it's this homophobic patriarchy that's responsible for this. And even though our protagonist is someone who's meant to be, like dealing with this for a while and has been like pushed into the closet quite aggressively there is still a young character for young audiences to kind of connect with she's welcomed into this queer community not only does she find a home but she gets this like very constructive lesson in the machinations of the community like where the finances come from how the community is organized the reality behind it all and it's also got this really cool sort of 80s splendor so if there's young people who are coming off that Stranger Things high and want to see some people in these great high-waisted jeans, then then this would be great. And it's not unbelievably grim for a film, which I think we discussed at the time when we did it on the podcast, is kind of like a horror film at some points. You know, it's like unbelievably tense. It's that very much like, is this person going to get found out? Are they not? Every person around you could possibly be an enemy. But there's still really uplifting moments about just the freedom of being yourself. And... um like, yeah, I think that like all the stuff that I was excited about at the time that it came out still holds up. It's still sticking in my head. It's, uh, well, it's just July now, so we're just out of Pride Month. But I do think that uh, the centering of, of these like very visibly queer people is just an exciting part of all queer cinema. And I think that it could become like a Pride mainstay. I think it's on Mubi right now or BFI. I can't remember which. It's on one of those two. But um, yeah, I think yeah. it might be BFI. I think, uh, yeah, like I think that people should definitely check out if they haven't already. I would love for it to get like another release, another run, maybe wind up spending a bit of a, like some time on a more populated streaming site, mm -hmm. just like getting it into more people's hands. But that's probably the film that I've enjoyed the most this year. It is a very, very good film. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, and you should go back and listen to, we had a big long discussion about it and about uh, Thatcherism, the 80s, <laughs> Britain, <laughs> things of this nature. Uh, okay. Hi guys, Louis Kamel here. My favourite film of 2023 so far has to be the amazing Rye Lane. It's the debut feature by Rain Alan Miller and it stars relatively unknown actors David Johnson and Vivian Opara, uh, who are amazing by the way. They've got this incredible chemistry. I can't wait to see them in other films, maybe even by this director. And it's a love letter to London more than anything else. Much like the city itself, it's densely packed. It just uses all of the time and the space that it has. And how it does that, it has these amazing sort of wide angle shots that tell multiple stories within one frame. It has these vibrant pots of colour right down to the shoes that the characters wear. Uh, it has these tricksy little kind of transitions between scenes and settings that remind you of stuff that Michel Gondry was doing at the early part of his career or that Boots Riley did in Sorry to Bother You. Uh, and it's funny. It's funnier than any sort of Richard Curtis rom-com I've seen in recent years. And it recaptures the, the vibrancy and the mood and the sense of community that those London areas have. So that is a very, very good start. Jamie, what's been your favourite film of low this bit of 2023 we've had my favorite film was one i don't think we actually spoke about on the show it was um one fine morning uh the mia hansen love film um, we didn't speak about this on the show so if anyone tries to say that this is basically just a glorified clip show this is new <laughs> material right here <laughs> my man um yeah i mean this is the kind of film that i think that gets a little bit overlooked in these types of discussions because it's not like flashy it's not topical really it's just a, you know it's not about a particularly extraordinary person it's about this single mother who's just getting on with her day it, it takes part, uh, part over a year um and yeah it's just it's just sort of it's just full of humanity and heartache and just puts you in this woman's shoes and sort of tells you a little bit about her life and her family and who she loves and it's sent on on this kind of extraordinary performance by uh, Lisa Du um who is always good, but I think she's particularly great here. Um, she plays a widow who's raising her kind of precocious 10-year-old daughter alone. Um, her, her husband's recently died. Her father, who's this kind of famous academic, um, he's kind of uh, rapidly 
becoming more ill. He's got dementia and she's having to deal with that. She's she's also kind of like a, a translator and like her job is like quite demanding. She works for like um like whole sorts of things like film festivals and works for like the UN and sort of government and things like that and uh, as a translator. Um, and that's incredibly demanding. Um, and on top of all that, she starts this affair with a married man who who she's known for years. She really loves, um, but she doesn't want to be in the position of being a mistress. So she's been turning all these different ways um, and she has all these bits of her life are just colliding at the same time. And, you know, it's, 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 I guess it's the way it happens in life. Like quite often, like it doesn't rain, but it pours, you know, you've got, you've got 20 things that you have to deal with. And that's, that's kind of captured on film. It's like, a, uh, it's about a woman who, like I say, for all intents and purposes, is a, is a very normal person with a very simple life. But then just suddenly for one year, she has complete chaos and it's how she deals with that. And I love that a film just centers on just a normal person and tells a person's uh, normal uh, everyday struggles, but it can actually be like high drama and really, really, uh, you know, just just great filmmaking it takes place over a year as well um and it, and it captures paris in such a beautiful way it's, so it kind of goes through all the seasons and the kind of seasons sort of ebb and flow with her moods as well so it's just like a really sunny beautiful film um really melancholy uh but yeah just i think just really really precise and and just sort of uh precise in the filmmaking very delicate in the way it tells this story uh, very careful in the way it tells this story and it just leaves you in an absolute puddle in the end you know like a yeah but also strangely uplifting you know it makes you think oh well i can get through my problems as well you know it's you know things pass and that, that's the kind of that's the feeling that you got from it and i i think mia hansen love she does make these kind of smaller quieter films with uh, you know people some people might say that they're boring because not much happens but actually she finds such drama and um sort of yeah like like i say compelling stories within these kind of small worlds um and i, and I really appreciate that and that one is on Mubi, actually. So you can watch it if you have Mubi. <laughs> it's on Mubi. Um, it does sound a little bit like, I mean, maybe to a less extreme extent, a little bit like Full Time, in that it's about, like, the high drama. I mean, they're both French. But also, it's about <laughs> it's about the high drama of regular life. Yeah, I mean, I, I love Full Time as well. Full Time's, I guess, more exciting. It is actually shot like a thriller. The thing about um, One Fine Morning is it is incredibly gentle, and it's like, like scenes... Uh, yeah, just scenes of everyday life, but it's, it's kind of heartbreaking. I mean, I think the uh, the most moving part is her relationship with her father. It's like based on Amy um, Love's own life. I think her, her father recently passed away from like a, a degenerative illness uh, similar to the, what the character has here. Um, and it's just about like the, you know, when your when your parents are getting older, like how tough that is, and like how like having to deal with that, you know like what is, what is best for them you know so it's like you know a child becoming an adult basically and having to become the kind of parent of your your uh your your own parent is is a really tricky thing and it's also a bit like a life because like is it, a big part of the film is about like what did she do with this guy's books you know this guy who is an academic whose books are almost his personality you know he's, he's this lifetime of collections but just like because she lived in a tiny apartment in, in, in Paris, what did she do with all this stuff? And it's like the heartbreak of giving this stuff away as well. So it's just like, again, like a, it seems like a small thing, but I think it's something that somebody might ad identify with, you know, like it's like, uh, yeah, these, these small things are big to people, you know, like, uh, and yeah, I, I just love how she, 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 she finds those kind of small stories and sort of makes them really special. Yeah, well that, yeah, like I say, One Fine Morning is on movie if you want to check it out. Big recommendation from Jamie. Hi, I'm Ross McIndoo and my favourite film from this year is Dean Fleischer Camp's Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. It's a mockumentary about a little shell who gets separated from his family and has to try and find his way back to them using YouTube and other modern tools. Um, it's incredibly warm and sweet and very, very funny. And I think it's also very insightful about the whole idea of community and what that means in an age where it's possible to be connected to loads and loads of people, but not necessarily in a very meaningful way. And I really liked it. Uh, Anna here. Hello. What? How are you? I'm okay. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm just having a fun time doing the podcast. That's nice. <laughs> um, is there a film from 2023 that you would like to speak about just now? Uh, yeah. I Well, famously, I have thought that this year is a shit year for films. Good start. Yeah. <laughs> That's my discourse. Um, so there isn't like a whole bunch. And I think my two favourites 
Um, I actually watched last year, so I don't really like associate them with this year. But I think for my money, the two best ones came out within like a week of each other in February. And that's when cinema peaked. <laughs> it's been <laughs> downhill since then. And that is All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, which was um, Laura Poitras's documentary made with Nan Golden about Nan Golden's art and kind of the way it intersected with the opioid crisis and her kind of activism in that. And then Alice Diop's uh, saint Omer, which I thought was stunning. Um, and I think both of them just felt very, like, formally daring in a lot of ways. They felt like the narrative was doing something. You know when you're, like, watching something and you can, like, feel the neurons in your brain, like, light up? Like, it feels like you're watching something happen in front of you. Like, you're watching, like, an activity. <laughs> like, that's how those two felt. In a way that everything else, even things that I've kind of really liked, or not everything else, but a lot of other things, even when I have really enjoyed them, it hasn't felt kind of... You haven't felt, like, the funny feeling in your tummy, you know? But I did feel it with those two. <laughs> Hi, Sydney Skinny team. Skinny contributor Tony Ingalls here. My film of the year so far is Laura Poitras' All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, which documents the life, art, and activism of photographer Nan Golden and her righteous quest to hold pharmaceutical giants, the Sackler family, accountable for their role in the opioid crisis. Even a documentary about one specific thing can tie itself up in knots. So what I love about Poitras' film is how it so deftly handles a number of interwoven threads protest, rebellion, violence, how you wield power and the cyclical nature of history. It could so easily be such a mess, but she's always in control of it, even as she flips between time periods that run from Nan's childhood through the AIDS crisis and onto these art gallery sittings she coordinates. And I love that it shows Nan's art within the context of the cultural moment. It reminded me so much of Todd Haynes' Velvet Underground documentary, which I also love. Both these films go so far beyond their subject focus and they end up being kind of about everything. And that shows the power of what's at their centre. And it's incredibly moving too. Nan wanted to show the humanity of her photo subjects and later in her life to restore the humanity of people who've died in the face of corporate greed. The film's just stunning. Anyway, keep up the good work. Love the show. I mentioned this back when we covered All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, but uh, the experience of watching, I mean, slight spoilers for this documentary, <laughs> but um, the sort of like Zoom meeting court session at the very end where the heads of this pharmaceutical company are required legally to listen to the testimonies of the people whose lives they've ruined that still stands out to me as an example of like this is a thing i've never seen before i've never seen this personal a level of mm. like like responsibility being pu pushed back into the hands of the people who are actually responsible for some of the yeah. suffering in the world so yeah like that's a real boon of cinema. It feels like so many of the films we see, they do kind of like communicate with each other and, you know, transmute each other's ideas. But this really was something that, like, I've never seen in a non-fiction film. No. Yeah. And I think kind of on that subject, I think what both of them did really well is I think we often talk about how like the personal is political but I think with both of those they were using like it's not just like an individual story but it's like a story that is very bound up with people's like intimacies with people's bodies with people's vulnerabilities and the way that that kind of articulates much broader narratives around like queerness around race and the way they do it is so like there's nothing kind of metaphorical about it um, which I thought, which is maybe the easiest way to kind of tell that sort of story. Um, but it is just very, like, it's just showing the underlying politics that kind of undergirds all of everyday life that you just can't get away from. And I thought that was really powerful. So I really, really love those. But yeah, I feel there still hasn't been, I feel last, last year it was Power of the Dog. Last year it was After Sun. There still hasn't been like, you know, that film that's mm. become like one of your favorite films of all time this year. Which is maybe like a big expectation to have of every year. I think it's also the problem that quite often all the the, the be best films of the year are pushed towards the end, you yeah. know, because of the way the like festival calendar falls, like Cannes and Venice, you know, are push everything towards the back. And then obviously the Oscar kind of run, a lot of the American, the great American films of the year are pushed towards the end of the year as well. So yeah, I think that is an issue with like the way distribution happens. Like yeah. it does force everything to be concentrated in one part of the year. Hello, my name's Carmen Paddock and I'm a film critic based in Glasgow who often writes for The Skinny. 
it's halfway through 2023 and it's been a really good year so far. Um, I do think so far my film of the year came out quite early. Um, I'm going with Todd Field's Tar, which was released in January. Um, it's Kate Blanchett as a terrifying but magnetic conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic who's juggling quite a lot, not only a recording of Mahler 5 and a relationship with her um, first violinist, but also other shady relationships which come to light over the course of the film. And I think it's one that stuck with me because despite its like massive runtime, it never feels like the marathon it is. And no matter what you've been told about the film, it just is a, such a weirder and more wonderful and more nuanced piece than I think any piece has captured, including this tiny little capsule review. Um, I think that a film that the film that I have enjoyed the most this year is going back and thinking about what I said. I mean, it's How to Blow Up a Pipeline, mm -hmm. which was really, really good. And I feel that it is probably due another go around because I think that it came out in a bit of... I feel like one of the things I felt about this year is that film in general doesn't seem to be doing a lot of things at once there seems to be a film comes out everybody talks about the film yeah the film is on and then it's gone yeah and there hasn't been a lot of prolonged hype or chat or whatever you'd want to call it to kind of sustain films beyond their initial push I think the subtext to this entire conversation is that there are actually two of the biggest films of the year are coming out on the same day in two weeks' time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is why we are doing this now. It's to give ourselves... The, this is like the coda before <laughs> the Oppenheimer Barbie extravaganza <laughs> that is inevitably coming. But yeah, I just thought that Pipeline is like, it's so direct and forceful and so sure of what it's doing. And it picks a side in a way that films of that nature, kind of like eco-thrillers, don't often do. And it does it with such conviction. And I believe that morally they are correct, which always helps in these kind of situations. <laughs> you don't want to watch a film about like where the, you identify the heroes as being baddies because then you're like, oh, now I feel morally conflicted. Yeah. No, I'm just watching a bunch of lads in cool jackets running around <laughs> blowing shit up, going hog wild at it. And when, when they do, and that when bad things do happen to them they happen to them in a way that still means they're the heroes legends love to see it yeah it's definitely the film of the moment if not that like maybe that's how i describe it like because it feels like you know like one fine day could have been released any year it's like it, you know but like how to the pipeline seems to me right like tuned into the zeitgeist so much you know yeah. it feels like so urgent so um speaking to this moment in time and then you know obviously the story just reflects what we're seeing in the news, you know, young people protesting, like, like you know, what we're seeing every day with, like, um, you know, just just stop oil um, and things like that. So, yeah, it, it felt really urgent. Um, and, yeah, I guess I, I also thought it was a great film, like, but also maybe the most important film might be a way to think about it or the, or the film of the moment, like I say. Mm. That's a film that you can put that in discourse and be like, yeah, take this, chat about this, have yourselves a lovely time. <laughs> and they will. And they will. Son of a bitch. Hello, I'm Roy Doherty, and my pick for the best film of the year so far is Skinnamarink, directed by Kyle Edward Ball. It's a experimental horror film um, that was shot for like $15,000 in the director's parents' house a couple of years ago. And it's about a couple of kids who during the night realize their home has been turned into a liminal space where their parents have disappeared. There's no doors or windows. Everything has just become very unusual and completely upsetting it's slow it's experiential it's uh, trades in the language of of slow cinema but there's something so completely absorbing about it and there are whole sequences which are genuinely taken from your nightmares so turn off all the lights throw your phone in another room and just get sucked in I don't. I don't know. How, I, I don't know how you fix that problem. I like, agree. Like there is something going on right now with film where it's hard to. I think. I think the, one of the problems is we talk about films so much. Like I feel like another film that I thought was a really great film of, um, of the year, but it seemed to kind of come and go at the cinema was Tar. Mm -hmm. Even though it was talked about so much, it was one of these films that was memed to death. I feel like I'd seen the film before it came out, and then it just came out and disappeared straight yeah. away. I think it was, you know it was like part of the Oscar buzz, but it was also part of this 
constant discussion uh, online about like uh, you know the pros and cons of the film and even what it was about it seems like nobody even agreed what the film was about like seemed, people seemed very confused about it because I think so, pe- so, so few people had actually seen it mm. you know they've just seen clips of it and from that clip they decided the film was uh, about something else so yeah I think that is something an issue we've got in terms of indie film like how do you how do, they, how do you get people to go to see these films if they're not in the cinema long enough and all the discussion about them happens online in this little bubble of film Twitter um, months ahead, months before it. Um, and then you've also got the problem of like, like we're talking about blockbusters right now, which are either, you know, like, re, uh, like churning up old franchises with like, with Harrison Ford just getting, being resurrected for Indiana Jones. You've got Tom Cruise being a psychopath uh, and like trying to save cinema through his like crazy action movies, and then next month, uh, next week, you've got this weird thing, this weird sort of challenge between Greta Gerwig making a film for Mattel, mm. which on one hand I should hate, but I'm really excited to see what she does with it, and then on the other hand, you've got this really, I, I mean, a, a kind of a original looking film, but from Christopher Nolan, and I feel like well, it's another Christopher Nolan film, so like. Who do you who do you cheer for in that battle? Who do you back? Yeah. I tried to explain that to I saw my mum on the weekend. I was trying to explain the Barbie Oppenheimer battle, and I was trying to explain like a smartphone to like someone from the 14th century. <laughs> like she simply was like, to explain "What a are you talking to Archimedes? Yeah, <laughs> to like, Archimedes. Oh, loved my dial. <laughs> now you come to me with this rectangle." <laughs> yeah, because and I think another thing, and uh, I mean, we're all we as a film podcast are guilty of this also, but. You can like both. You can yeah. enjoy yeah. Oppenheimer and Barbie and Pipeline and One Fine Morning. Like, there is time enough to watch them all. And there is a weird thing that I think that actually, in reality, as much as there is a greater availability of certain films or, like, archive films or whatever, like, you can see small independent films from around the world more easily than you could when they were only on in cinemas but people's ability to actually invest time and energy in watching and really engaging with and discussing and continuing a discussion around them is, is the same that it's the same amount that it's always been. Yeah. So there isn't a, like the difficulty with just like there being a glut of information to deal with, which we are all finding low in this year of 2023 is that actually like if there's loads of information to deal with, but you have the same amount of capacity to deal with it as you have before you then just have to pick and choose which bits you go for and then you're probably going to pick the ones that your pals have picked because nobody wants to be the person just sitting there talking for ages about a film that nobody else has seen. That's yeah. why I have you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what it is as well, I think? It is, I think I, and I would argue by extension all of us, are really feeling the loss of the film house in Edinburgh because there have been like quite a few films where I've sort of been, One Fine Morning was one of them and I did actually try and go to see that and then the cameo screen broke. Um, but One Fine Morning was one. The Eight Mountains was kind of out. There's been, like, several things where I haven't seen it at a film festival and it's not out at, like, Cineworld where I have, like, my little unlimited card. Um, but the cameo is so expensive. Like, no harm to the cameo. Like, God bless them. But it's so expensive. Mm. And you are... Like, I just don't. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I just won't. <laughs> like, I don't have the money to do yeah. it, like, every week. Yeah. And I think that that is also, when I kind of think about what I've seen, it has been, like, things I've seen at, like, Venice and, like, London, um, things that show at Cineworld, and even that has been few and far between, because if you're no longer, I've just been too exhausted to see the last two Marvel films, so then that's, like, a big, that's, like, what's in Cineworld for, like, three weeks, and then you just don't go for an entire month. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, like, the smaller ones, do I have £12.50? to spend i i'm also struggling with the sort of word of mouth capabilities of film Mm. right now like so another film that came out in february that i was actually really really fond of was ennis main which Mm. i can't remember if we talked about on the podcast maybe just in like a little what we've been watching thing but it was sort of a weird isolated folk horror that looked incredibly retro incredibly spooky just like a like a Probably like the one really good horror film I've seen this year. Um, but I can't find anyone, even people I know who are big horror fans, who've seen it. The one that was sort of doing all the chat that technically came out this year was Skinamarink, because when it got sort of, it like went viral on TikTok last year. So, but I, I, did, I like, I thought it was quite rubbish. And, and it was just like, I went into HMV recently and I saw that they had like a physical Blu ray of Ennis Main, like, 
on the shelves, which I didn't expect to see. And I'm just like, where, like, why are people not picking this up? Like, where, mm. like, you know, how do you sort of just grab people by the shoulders and shake them and tell them go watch this film, watch that film? They're all, they're all interesting. I think that it's just that there needs to be like a more enthusiastic broader conversation around the kind of films coming out right now yeah Yeah. but then what creates that conversation is community space Mm. and then that's what i think is lacking yeah i mean i think that's why film festivals are important as well like i mean i think it's maybe no coincidence that um one fine morning and how to pull up pipeline which are two of my favorites i saw at glasgow Mm. you know and i think you know seeing films in those environments are also important um you know it's like you're seeing it not just in a cinema but with a kind of cinema community um there's kind of real more bit more of a buzz about it they feel more special in that sort of space and yeah i think you're totally right and he hit it in the head that um you know the loss of film house um is is kind of felt um and I, I'm, I'm i'm probably missing out um i, I know living in glasgow but like I, like when i was in edinburgh i've missed a lot of mm. uh, films on the big screen anyway and i think seeing something on your computer screen or on your tv even is not quite the same so no it's not the same and it's something that i kind of noticed and this is like less to do with this year specifically but it's a theory that I've had for a while that kind of watching art house films is or any kind of like art that is like more complex is quite incompatible with capitalism like frankly like the only time in my life that I have really been able to like watch things in a really experimental and free way um and it doesn't matter if you don't like it and you just try it was during lockdown when like I was watching two or three things a day and it was like all of the movie like releases and all that kind of stuff. Whereas now I am so tired all the time (laughs) that I just can't, like I want to watch that stupid Georgian film that you keep (laughs) talking, but I just don't have it in me. Like when I get home to sit down for two and a half hours and watch, like I just can't, like I physically cannot do that. But then at a cinema that's slightly easier because then you're kind of just trapped and your mood is kind of, tuned in more towards You've that anyway. You've blocked out the time. You've blocked out the time, yeah. exactly. Same with festivals, you think, okay, I'm going to watch three films today. Yeah. You would never do that normally. No. You know, you just don't have the capacity. Yeah. Well, I have a capper for this bit that is about, <laughs> that really speaks to a lot of these things and is not the thing that I enjoyed the most, but one of the most lasting memories of watching films from 2023 was when I watched Dogtooth for the first time, the Yorgos Lanthimos film. Anyone who's not seen it, it's about this this family with young adults living in a big isolated house who become convinced by the patriarch that they should never leave and the world is a hostile place and they have their kind of like own internal language. One for fans of big affect. But <laughs> I watched this film in a very 2023 way, which was on the ITV player. Oh, wow. So I watched Yorgos Lanthimos's Greek weird wave modern classic Dogtooth in a form where every 15 minutes... <laughs> It would be interrupted by incredibly loud Candy Crush adverts. (laughs) And they would do their best to get them in the right place. But sometimes you'd get like just beyond the boundary of a scene and cut to the next scene, another long static shot of someone in a perfectly buttoned up white shirt. And then it would just bang in with the Candy Crush or like a full blast advert for Gala Bingo, which is apparently (laughs) a thing that's still going. So, I mean, 2023 in film so far, I would say... B on the report card. B minus. B minus. At least. Yeah. Could do mm-hmm. better. Come back and see me after <laughs> Barbie and Oppenheimer have come out. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just hope, like, I just worry for the cinemas. I mean, I've heard, uh, like, from people who work at cinemas that Blue Jean actually did really well. Um, All the Beauty did really well. Um, uh, How to Bob a Pipeline did really well. Mm-hmm. But then. Apart from those, you know, they're, like they're having a few months, like these recent few months, there's not been tons out. So, you know, I think obviously Asteroid City will be doing really well. But otherwise, like what, what else are, are people going to see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They really have put every actor in Asteroid City as well. So it's like yeah. very much all of cinemas, <laughs> all of independent cinemas eggs in one large <laughs> but very ornate basket. Okay, and before we go, speaking of places that you can watch films with people, the Edinburgh International Film Festival program is out, I believe, the day this comes out. The morning this comes out. Yes. Is that correct? It is correct. Someone wave a press release at me just to double check. Yes. Got it. Cool. <laughs> so the, the program may literally have just come out as you're listening to this podcast. So we're going to do a fuller roundup of it closer to the time because festival is like running in a more condensed time frame so it's like the 18th to the 24th 5th someone with a press release nod to let me know if the date is right what were you saying yes 18th to the 24th the to the 23rd 18th to the 23rd of august so we're going to do a very brief 
hourly highlights now, and then we'll come back to this at a later date. Jamie, what have you got for me? Well, it's a more po- compact program. Um, I think it looks pretty good, actually. There's lots of good stuff uh, that jumps out. Um, of the bigger name directors, I'm really looking forward to Passages, which is a new film from Ira Sachs, uh, he who made great films like Little Men and Love is Strange. Um, this one's a kind of love triangle film. Uh, ben Wishaw, Franz Rogowski, and uh, Adele Exaropoulos, uh, excellent actress. Um, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really down for that. I think I love those three. I love Iris Axe. Um, that's that's maybe the film that jumped out to me straight away of the bigger names, but you've got people like Kelly Wrightcart in there. You've got, um, yeah, lots of good stuff. Um, tons of queer films. Um, one that we're really excited for at the Skinny's Femme, um, which is a, a really cool British thriller um, that involves a, a drag queen being beat up and then later she kind of takes revenge on the guy who beats her up. Um, yeah, fantastic. Um, I'm also looking forward to the retrospective. I think they've got a, like a handful of retrospective stuff, but the, the all looks excellent. They've got the 20th anniversary screening of Dead Man's Shoes, which um, the Shane Meadows film, which will be really cool. I also really want to see Variety. It's a film that I've always wanted to see for ages. Uh, Betty Gordon's film from like the early 80s, up at uh, you know like an underground New York classic, I actually features Nan Golden um, in it. Um, in a role um so you you actually see clips of it uh, quite a lot and uh uh, all the beauty and the bloodshed so yeah that's that's another one that's that's uh almost see for me nice anna hugh um i am really excited for fremont fremont how do you say that fremont fremont Fremont, um which is the closing film by uh director babak jalali um and it stars the boy from the band (laughs) i'm very excited (laughs) That's all I've got to say on that. Um, no, Jagu looks really, really good. It's about, um, I think it's like a kind of drama comedy situation um, about like a kind of Afghan refugee woman. And then um, he's also in it. <laughs> I actually don't even know what he's doing in it. I just know he's in it. Um, but it looks really, really beautiful. And it's like meant to be um, like almost a bit, um, is it Jim Jarmusch? Jim Jarmusch, yeah. Yeah, like that kind of like quite deadpan, like isn't it black and white, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Some, and it's got um, Greg Tarkington from the hit Tim Heidecker on cinema at the cinema stuff, <laughs> like the driest man in the world. So <laughs> It just looks like a very curious film, I'm very excited. Um, and then the other one that I was really excited about is Celine Song's Past Lives, um, which again, just people have been like ramping up a lot and seems to be a very beautiful very heartbreaking tale about diaspora, uh, which is very up my street. Um, but yeah, it is, I think because it's such a compact program, it's very good because there is no space for like yeah. bad things. All, all filler, no, uh, yeah, uh, exactly. all, all killer, no filler. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> all filler. <laughs> all filler. Like no, that, really that, that's our po- yeah. 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 Just like <laughs> That's our podcast. <laughs> all like sawdust in our notes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and one other thing as well that like I haven't had a chance to fully dig into the program but I did read it when a copy appeared in the office last week cheap tickets the tickets are not expensive yeah. I, think really? the, I think a standard ticket is like £10 oh my god um, and they have concessions and stuff and they're also doing they're doing like outdoor screenings but those are like more kind of they're slightly more avant-garde than the usual kind of like outdoor screening stuff so they have an alchemy film festival like outdoor screening and they have a bunch of other stuff as well it's a really good program it's it's out now like i said we're going to do a full run through but go and check it out i'm sure there'll be something on the website that yeah, you can read seven pound concession fuck me that's, so that's a ringing endorsement <laughs> if ever there's been one <laughs> that's wild are we an arts worker do we count as arts workers yeah okay great i feel, I feel like this might be chat for the walk back to the office <laughs> Uh, so yeah so I think that's us done for today thank you Lewis thank you thank you Anahit thank you thank you Jamie thank you Uh, thanks to Carmen Ross Tony and Louis for sending in their favourite films of 2023 so far which were all edited in at various points during this episode we should have maybe said that before they were edited yeah (laughs) just gonna be a nice little treat yeah well I mean like jump scare yeah (laughs) it will be apparent that their voices have changed (laughs) They've all been asked to introduce themselves. This is all very kind of like post and pre hoc justification <laughs> of something that still at this point has not happened yet. But yes, <laughs> thanks to all of them. Uh, thanks to everybody for sending in their contributions. Uh, thanks to EHFM. Thanks to Fina and Jamie for getting us set up. EHFM.live. It's a very good radio station. It's very good. Um, we will be back in two weeks, all things being well, with a grand showdown between Oppenheimer 
and Barbie, a weapon so powerful that no one could truly control it, <laughs> and something about an atomic bomb. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to come up with four or five of those. Okay. Uh, just kind of, yeah. You'll have to, Pierre. <laughs> no one has yeah. made you last yeah. year. <laughs> anyway, that's us. <laughs> Bye. Right, bye, everybody. Bye. bye.